Coming up on this month's Photography Online, we continue our focus on panoramic photography and we give away this Kite Optics prize worth £250. Grab a chocolate bar and a cream cake because for the next 30 minutes we're celebrating everything that's wide. Welcome to part two of our April 2021 show, which is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. If you don't know what a VPN is, then a little later in the show, we'll be telling you how you can benefit from using one. First of all, though, let's get started with this second part of our panoramic show, which means I need to do this and this. There we go, now we're in widescreen, that's better. Now, as I just mentioned, we have this amazing pair of Kite Optics binoculars to give away. We'll be telling you about them later on in the show, but to win them, simply look out for them as they'll be making an unexpected appearance somewhere in the next 30 minutes. So keep your eyes peeled. Simply note down the time on the video where they appear and enter this as your answer using the competition link, which you'll find down below. It is that simple. All right, well, let's get this show underway. Many of you have sent in your your panoramic images for a checkup in the photography online surgery. On duty today is Dr. Brew to give his verdict on a few which caught his eye. Thanks, Ruth. I've got a waiting room full of wide images. In fact, we had to take the door off the hinges just to get some of them into the surgery. Let's take a look at the first one on the examination table. The first image here is from Frederick and it's an absolutely gorgeous shot of the Aurora Borealis and I think he's done an absolutely fantastic job here because the Aurora is notoriously difficult to capture panoramic images of because it's relatively fast moving across the sky which can make stitching quite difficult but this is absolutely wonderful and a lot of the stars look very pinpoint as well so obviously there's been very good astrophotography technique used to get this shot. If I was to critique it, I think some of the stitching is a little bit off. You can see just down here, here as well, and then around here is where I suspect the stitching has occurred and there's some artifacts in there. Also interestingly, out on the right of the image, just out here, you can see that the horizon line kinks upwards potentially suggesting that there was a bit of a leveling issue with the tripod um, but that being said i think it's a wonderful shot and considering how many images have been stitched together to give this ultra wide view i think it's a, a pretty solid job overall moving on to the next shot from keith this is an absolutely gorgeous panoramic image taken in torridon i believe and you've done a very good job here Rainbows and fleeting moments like them are very difficult to capture panoramic images of and I think you've done a very solid job here. I love the rainbow going across the scene here and then I particularly like the misty rain captured out to the right hand side here. It's got a real lovely sense of scale this image. Um, if I was to critique it there are a few dust spots, there's one there and there's one there so clone those out. Um, also on this particular side you can see that there's no horizon as such in this image but the cloud line here bends down unnaturally suggesting some warping when you've stitched this together and also finally these people down here in the bottom left act as a main focal point for me and I feel they're too close to the boundary um, of the image and I would like to see a little bit more breathing space around them um, but overall really really nice shot. On to the next image from Kevin and this is an absolutely gorgeous black and white long exposure minimalistic panoramic image and I think it's superb I think the editing is fantastic and the panoramic technique is flawless really it's hard to find fault with this I really like how you've turned a fairly mundane scene into something quite mysterious and captivating and the positioning of these wooden posts out here on the left hand side leaves all this space on the right hand side and I think it works very well for that minimalistic kind of approach. If I was to critique it, and I'm really, really um, having to be quite picky here, but particularly in some parts of the image, there's some sort of dark sort of areas, 
and I just wonder whether that is the vignetting in the corners of the stitched images just coming through slightly but I very very much am scraping the barrel here overall it's an absolutely stonking shot on to our next image from Shep and I really appreciate this shot because it feels quite unique um, there's a tendency with panoramic images just to focus on the big vistas but this shows you that you can take intimate scenes with the panoramic technique and I really like the fact that there's a very strong contrast between these orange leaves and the dark forest behind and also there's some nice mist in these trees here that just softens the scene also, when you're shooting panoramics like this where the foreground is very close to the camera, um, it adds an extra challenge of parallax into the shot. Um, and I have to say, <laughs> having looked very closely at this image, I can't find any flaw whatsoever with your technique here. So you've shot this incredibly well. If I was to critique it, I would say that potentially, particularly on this left-hand side, it feels slightly underexposed. I appreciate that you're trying to get the contrast between the orange leaves and the dark forest behind, but it just feels slightly on the dark side. Also, particularly with the leaves around here, I'd be tempted to try and dodge those leaves a little bit just to bring out that contrast just that little bit more. I think it will strengthen this left part of the image, but overall, a really, really eye-catching scene this. On to our next shot from Richard here, and I absolutely adore this shot. I think it's got so many strengths. It's a gorgeous winter scene. Firstly, I really appreciate the strong contrast between these pre-dawn orange hues in the sky and the crisp, cold, wintry scene below. I think it works really well. Also, I like the dynamic and the relationship between the very modern wind turbine here and the not so modern shed here out on the right hand side. I think it's a very interesting relationship through the scene. Also the panoramic technique is flawless and it's exposed very, very well. If I was to critique it in any way, I would say that out here on the left hand side, this side of the canal just feels like it needs a little bit more breathing space so I'd be tempted to crop it out slightly wider. And the same actually applies just to the right here of the shed. It feels like it needs a little bit more breathing space out to the side of it. But I'm really picking holes on this, but overall I think it's a very, very strong image indeed. And the final shot we move on to is from Andy, and this may well be the pick of the bunch for me. Um, this is a four image panoramic, and each of the frames has five exposure brackets in, and this is taken with a drone which blows my mind because the panoramic is absolutely seamless, it's exposed really well and it's just incredible. I'm very, very impressed that you took a shot like this with the drone. Um, I think this factory out here on the right hand side just acts as a really, really nice focal point in this snow covered valley. And just the way that the mist hangs over this valley basin here, just looks absolutely wonderful, I think. The sky looks really nice as well, with some beautiful sort of orange and yellow hues popping through there. Really, really lovely overall. If I was to critique it in any way, there's one thing that bothers me slightly, and it's just this section here. Out on the left-hand side, you can see that the highlights are totally blown in this area of the image. Um, so potentially it might have been worth um, running your exposure brackets just a bit more aggressively to try and get some dynamic range back into this part of the image. But again, I'm being quite picky and considering this was taken with a drone, I think you should be very, very proud of yourself. It's a fantastic shot. Most of the comments I've made are obviously very subjective and are just my opinion. Um, if you do have any thoughts on any of these images, pop them down below in the comments because it's always really good to hear your thoughts. And if you'd like to submit any images to our future surgeries and future shows, you can find a link down in the description for that. But that's it for today.
Thanks, James. And thanks to you for sending in all your panoramic photos. We can't possibly feature them all, so if we weren't able to show your image this time, don't be disheartened. Keep sending your photos in and maybe you'll be luckier next time. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the show, this episode of Photography Online is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. So to tell us more about how to use it, here's Harry. Here at Photography Online, we need to be constantly connected to our various websites, social media outlets, and email accounts. We do this on multiple devices from home, the office, and when we're out working. Surfshark VPN encrypts all the data we send and receive from any device, protecting us when we use public Wi-Fi connections. Its clean web feature protects us from scams and malware, which may catch us off guard when we're working abroad. Surfshark also allows us to change our virtual location, enabling us to connect to the internet as if we were still in the UK, eliminating any issues with geo restrictions messing up our workflow. Surfshark lets us connect an unlimited number of devices with just a single membership, meaning we can keep our phone, tablet and computer all protected at once. Surfshark is dead easy to set up and has to be the best value service out there. If you want to get the same benefits we do, then use the code PHOTOGRAPHY to get a massive 83% off plus three extra months for free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you really have nothing to lose. Use the links in the description below to get protected now. Now, last month, we launched the first of our official Photography Online merchandise. You can now pick up these t-shirts or beanie hats in our online shop. The t-shirts come in five different sizes from small to extra, extra large and can be shipped to wherever you are in the world. And while you're in the shop, don't forget we have our ECS book and our annual magazine, both 68 pages of photography goodness. We'll also be adding more items in the coming months and we'll let you know when these are available. Now, I hope you've been keeping an eye out for these Kite Optics binoculars, which we're giving away Way, they are making an unexpected appearance somewhere in the show which may or may not have happened yet and to win them all you need to do is enter the time on the video when they made their appearance we'll give you a few seconds either side of the actual answer but enter your time on the competition link and we'll pick a winner at random on next month's show now kite optics make a range of high quality binoculars and scopes with this particular pair being a mid-range optic worth 249 pounds harry has been using these recently to help him spot various wildlife subjects so Harry what do you reckon to them? I've been really impressed with them actually for the price of them they're fantastic quality even compared to something that's two three times as expensive plus they're a hell of a lot lighter than any of those bigger more expensive models which in my book is a big bonus. Okay well let's stick with the subject of wildlife but combine it with the theme of the show panoramic photography and see how the two can work together. This month on Wild Diaries, I wanted to show you how to apply the principles of panoramic photography to wildlife. When people think of panoramas, most people picture landscapes, but that doesn't mean to say we can't use it in wildlife photography. Allowing more space either side of our subject increases the chance of storytelling and creating a more engaging shot. I'm here in my own eagle hide, and while waiting for the action to start, I thought I'd give my colleague James a call, as I know he favors a good wildlife panorama. Hello James, how are you doing? Hi Harry, nice to see you. How are you doing? All well, I hope? Yeah, not too bad at all. I'm trapped up here in my eagle hide. Want to see something that's going to make you jealous? There we are. How about that? Well, it seems like you've got a better view than I have from what I can see there. Absolutely, yeah. It's a pretty incredible view. I've got a panorama all the way of the Trotonish Ridge, all the way through to the Cooley Mountains. So quite apt considering what we want to talk about on Wild Diaries this month. Um, by the way, if I go quiet all of a sudden, then, well, either I've lost phone signal or it's because an eagle has come down onto the bait. So carry on without me. And panoramic is the key thing because that's what we're here to talk about. And in fact, I've trawled through uh, the MC2, the Photography Online Archive, and dragged out a whole bunch of images that um, will have some relevance to, you know, composition and cropping and panoramas and letterbox formats and all of that sort of thing. So I thought we'd have a good look through them. Um, as you can see on the screen here, there's one to kick us off. In terms of panorama, this is a really, really good example of telling a story. So if you look right in this corner here, I'm just going to lose, so it's in a 3 by one format now, I've already loaded that in, so as you can see, but you know, if we stretch it out and include this piece of black here, it kind of ends the stag's journey. 
So just by cropping that out and finding a natural balance of him to walk on this nice hillside, bringing in a little bit of the sun setting, it was a sunset rather than a sunrise that. Then we have an equal amount of blank space of sky here, blank space of sky here, and he's on a journey and he's on his way. And I think overall that kind of works there. Now it's a little bit hard to see it, so I'm just going to put it on a white background. It makes it a little bit clearer to see there the finished crop. And I think that kind of works really. And I think, you know, panoramas are very, very, very useful for telling stories. And in this case, telling the story of a journey. Yeah, definitely. I think the way that's been cropped really improves it. The elements you've gotten rid of weren't adding anything to the scene particularly. And as you say, it really tells a much better story in panoramic. So um, you've got another one there for us. The reason I kind of picked this out to talk about from this whole letterboxing panoramic point of view is actually this picture as a standalone picture works perfectly well anyway. But the interesting thing with it is, I think, let's just give it that crop again and we'll start with that three to one again. We won't necessarily end up with it, but, but actually in a funny kind of way, a bit like the previous deer there, we're now drawing attention to something that it doesn't have great light quality on it, but it doesn't always have to, to tell a story. So if I just, I'm just going to undo the padlock there, give myself a little bit more room to play with. So if I try something along those lines, what do you think of that? Yeah, well, I mean, I liked the, the original shot as it was, but then cropping it into panorama, um, as Marcus described in the last show, a panorama places less emphasis on the foreground and the background, so it's much more about the subject and the space either side of it, and, and that does work really, really well. I guess it's all about end usage and where you intend to use your pictures, really, but assessing a, assessing a full frame, so if I go back to the full frame, as we can see there, then, you know, don't always think that you have to use the full frame. You can crop, you can do, you can make all sorts of things with panorama. You can tell very, very different stories in essence. The next one I've chosen, Harry, for us to have a good look at is slightly unusual. What do you think about this from a panoramic point of view? Well, I mean, that, isn't that just an out of focus image, James? I'm struggling to make anything out there. It's a hen pheasant, which I know you'd be struggling to see up in the hide up there, but yeah, that's what it is. So I'm going to go back to our three by one again and show you the reason that I chose this one is because I just love the fact that this bird is a bird of camouflage. It is a bird that hides away in long grass. And when you crop it as a panorama like this, it's not, you know, again, it goes back to the end usage thing and where you're actually going to be displaying this image. So if you're looking at it on a phone in an upright position, no good whatsoever but as a storytelling piece, this works really, really well for me because the bird is truly hidden and truly just, you know, it's in a huge field of grass and it does work. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it works so much better as a, as a panorama. Now I can see the next image you've got there and this is one that just screams for a panoramic crop. Um, and if you bring up the crop tool and just have a look and the, the top 15 and bottom 15% really aren't doing much to the image there. So immediately removing those draws all the attention to the subject and to that wake that it's trailing across the water. With this, look, we've, what we've done with the panorama, it's, th what's this shot? Directionality. Panoramas are fantastic for directionality. It's this huge trail of water catching the light, heavily backlit like that. It's just as you rightly said, as soon as you saw it, it screams panorama. Why not? And why not accentuate the journey that that little tufted duck is on really. And the important thing, composition, is the fact that this really only works with the duck on the right hand side of the image rather than on the left. And that's because of that trail of water that's leading in. We can see the journey the bird has taken, which just wouldn't work if we'd cropped it differently. Now the next image here isn't one that you'd typically look at and think, yeah, that's a panorama. But um, if we bring up the crop tool and see if we just get rid of this grass that's in the foreground which um, while it's nice to include a little bit of that habitat it could also be argued that it's a little bit distracting so by cropping off that that bottom half of the image almost and a little bit off the top we're then creating much more focus on the subject the puffin and its home looking at that lighthouse in the distance and its and its domain its habitat its environment 
So yeah, just I would just include the, the water in the corner there just so it's got something to, to look down into. Yeah, perfect. Yep, there you go. So now he's got the white water to look at. Job done, amazing. As you rightly said, he's at home with the lighthouse in his background. You know, he's surveying, he's the boss, he's the king, king of the mountain there. Now I've got one more image to, uh, to look at before we hand back to Ruth, but um, I'm gonna hand this one over to you because I, I think I've just seen a, an eagle coming by. So what do you think about uh, cropping with this shot? Now this is very interesting because there is absolutely, it's nailed on as a fine arts piece of photography. I don't like that term very much, but there you go. It is, and you know, it's beautifully lit. And all of this, all around it works. So you're thinking, well, why on earth would you fiddle around with it and put it into a panoramic format? Well, there is no real reason other than just to demonstrate once again how things can really work and how you can accentuate the story. Now I'm going to do something there, I think. Let's just have a look at that. Just make it a tiny bit bigger. And I'm just going to change that background. It's a good tip actually to change these background colours. It helps seeing cropping because now it's on white it makes the white of the lion's face stand out so now it's not so much a fine art print it, it, i mean it still is to some degree or a fine art piece of photography now it's more about a bit of behavior because the lion is actually going somewhere and we've got rid of the environment now it's just about the lion but again this is all subjective but you know it's an incredibly strong image and it just goes to show that just because you end up with something that's pretty fantastic to start with anyway then you know, you shouldn't revisit these things and rethink about them at other times. I'm just going to drop that to a medium grey there, so it's not so daunting there. So there are many, many different ways to skin a lion. How's that for a, a lion at the end there, Harry? So. I can't talk now, the eagle's just landed, so I'm going to hand you back to Ruth. Good luck with your eagles, buddy. Thanks to James and Harry there. As you can see, the panoramic format can be applied to so many genres and it's the perfect ratio to fill those blank spaces on many walls. In part one of this month's show, we showed you various ways to shoot panoramic images, ranging from using a dedicated panoramic camera to shooting a triptych, where you can display three images to work in harmony in a single frame. Photography online expert Nick Hansen also showed us the first stage of what is probably the most common technique, shooting a sequence of standard images, which can then be stitched together seamlessly to create a single high resolution panoramic image. Armed with his needle and thread, he's back to show us the second stage of the process. I've got the five images we captured together in the field in Lightroom. I'm going to stitch these together seamlessly to create a high resolution panoramic image that you'll be proud to hang on your wall. If you haven't done this before, don't worry, it's really easy, so let's get into Lightroom and get this done. Okay, so I've got my first image selected. So all we need to do is hold down the shift key of the keyboard and click on the last image. And there we have all five images of this panoramic selected. Now what we do is go up to the photo menu, photo merge and panorama. Now, depending on how powerful your computer is, you may want to go away for a cup of tea. Well, Lightroom completes the first stage in the process, which is building a preview of your panorama. One thing to note at this point is that you shouldn't have made any changes to your images before completing the first part of the process as we'll be doing all the changes to the stitched image. Now that we have our preview on the screen, as you can see we have these various options on the right hand side of this window. So first up we have the projection. Now I'm not going to go into great detail on what these are. All that I can suggest is that you experiment with each of these three options to find out which one works best for your image. 99% of the time I find that spherical, which is the default one, works best for my landscape images. You'll also find these options of boundary warp and fill edges. However, if you've got things right at the capture stage and everything is nice and level, you'll find that you won't have to rely on these. And finally, we have auto crop and auto settings. Now I'm not going to use these because I want full control when I'm editing the final image. Now all we need to do is click on the merge button and watch the magic happen before our eyes. Once Lightroom has finished merging the panorama, you will find that there's an extra image in the film strip. All we need to do now is click on that image and edit it in the same way as we would any other photo. So after merging and editing my photo, here's the final result.
that's a great way to get super high res images on your wall without the need for a high resolution camera. It also seems really easy to do, so hopefully we've inspired you to give it a go for yourself. Now, as mentioned earlier in the show, there are a few dedicated panoramic cameras which are designed to be shot in the letterbox format without having to crop. All of these, as far as we know, are film cameras, but this got us thinking, why has there never been a dedicated digital panoramic camera? To find out and to see if it's ever likely to change, we caught up with Chris Coos, the technical communications manager at Hasselblad, the makers of the most iconic panoramic camera in history. Hi Chris, thanks for joining us today on Photography Online. Hi, nice to be here. Today we're doing a, a special show which is dedicated to panoramic photography. So I wanted to have a quick chat about what I think is probably one of the world's most iconic dedicated panoramic cameras, the Hasselblad X-Pan. Um, now there'll be lots of people watching who may not be familiar with this camera, so I thought maybe you could just bring us up to speed and tell us a bit about it. Yeah, well, it, the actual original X-Pan version 1 uh, was launched in 1998. Um, the whole point of this camera, if you like, was the ability to be able to swap between standard 2436 and 65 by 24 uh, with, with a, a mechanical lever effectively. So on the same roll of film, you can swap between panoramic and standard uh, 35 millimeter frame. And that way you, you can get a standard camera, if you like, plus the X-Pan uh, panoramic views, which people just loved. I believe you've got the X-Pan with you there, just so you can show people who aren't familiar with it. Yeah, so I mean, this is the X-Pan 2, and it's a fantastic little unit. You know? uh, for a rangefinder camera, it's quite compact. Uh, I think you can, can see the lenses are pretty small, uh, and that's one of the beauties of it. A very high quality lens, compact camera. But I have to say, if you look at um, today's equivalent, uh, this is our current X1D, with the 45mm uh, compact lens on it and there's not a huge amount of difference in terms of size. Actually the X1D is lighter than the X-Pan 2. Well I used to have one um, because going back to the 1990s, I know I probably don't look old enough um, to be using a camera in the 90s, but um, I was actually sponsored by Hasselblad and they provided me with an X-Pan 2, so I used to use it uh, on a regular basis. One of the really clever things about it was that as you flicked it from panoramic mode into standard mode, the, the, the film mechanism was, was electronic and it would automatically adjust the film and you'd hear it moving very slightly inside the camera. So Just to if you had it in panoramic yep. mode um, and then flipped it back to standard mode, it would rewind the film by just a few centimetres so that just it so was nicely lined up. Yep. Yep. Um, which, was, which was really good. I mean, that was the clever thing about it. But that brings us on to um, you know, the reason for talking to you today is that I remember having a discussion with you know, one of your previous colleagues um, and he said to me, there'll never be a digital version of this camera because we just can't make a sensor big enough. But this was 20 years ago, things have moved on. Um, and you know, I just wondered whether you thought from a company point of view, whether there was the potential to invent a digital version of the X-Pan because it would be so much easier than the film version because you wouldn't need that film mechanism to go backwards and forwards which was the the, you know, the main part of the camera. I think we, we get you know I would say reasonably frequent requests are you guys going to make a new a digital X-Pan uh, with a specifically designed sensor. Um, the problem there is uh, to bring out an X-Pan sensor just for that um, sure, you can crop uh, a 36-24 section out of it, no problem at all with that. But the cost involved uh, is, is very, very high just to make a digital sensor. Especially when you think, these days, if you take our X1D camera, you're using a 44-33 type sensor. You know, you've got 8,200 pixels across that width. And it's very simple for us to uh, crop down to that panoramic format across that sensor if you like letterbox it to give you the correct ratio and obviously with EVFs and things like that the actual view that you get in the camera viewfinder is, is probably a better view than you would have got through the optical finder anyway in terms of we can black it out so you get that panoramic view you know exactly what you're getting within your your composition uh, 
but you get the additional benefits if you like as when you bring that file into the system because it's an electronic crop the camera itself is actually capturing the whole frame but you've got that electronic crop and if you think oh I wish I'd gone a little bit higher a bit lower you have the option to nudge and so on so if you like you've got all of the the capture benefits of the XPAN you know you can see what you're getting you've got that um, experience but later on in post you've got a little bit of wiggle room to fine-tune so I think the benefits of that and plus the ease of doing that within a standard camera sort of outweighs making a dedicated XPAN camera again so I think you'll see more and more move towards you know additional features for that XPAN experience or that crop experience within the camera. But the difference from a photographer's point of view I think speaking as a photographer myself is if you have a camera in your bag which is a dedicated and, and marketed as a panoramic camera when you're looking for subjects you, you you're looking in that wide kind of you know vision you're thinking well I've got a panoramic camera in my bag and that's how you see the world yep. and so whereas if you if you've got what you describe you've got a you know a three by two ratio or four by three ratio camera in your bag which can just crop and top and bottom to, to give you that panoramic you still don't think you know, you're not looking in the world with that panoramic exclusive thing. That's that's the difference from a photographer's point of view, I think. Yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, but because uh, the viewfinder is blacked out so that, you know, you don't have any uh, anything else but the uh, panoramic view, when you put it to your eye, that's all you've got, if that's how you choose to set the camera up. So you can sure. force yourself, if you like, to work that. But I, I get where you're coming from, that... If there's no choice but panoramic, you, your mind works in a way to force you to think that way. So sure. Yeah. No, just and, and, you know, from a marketing point of view, I mean, you'll know a lot more about this than I do. Um, but you know, marketing is incredibly important in selling cameras, and I just think if you can brand a camera to be a specialist in one particular area, it gives you just by having that badge <laughs> XPAN, you know, digital XPAN. It's all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I'm, now I'm interested. You know? Yeah, I, I fully understand where you're coming from. But uh, as I say, I think at the moment that the costs for a dedicated sensor uh, are quite prohibitive. Obviously, you could use the camera body, etc., from wherever and put that sensor in. So if you like, there is a saving there. But uh, I think short term anyway, <laughs> there's, there's little chance of a digital XPAN um, purely because of that sensor building cost. Okay, well, thanks for giving us your time today. It was a pleasure talking to you. And if the situation changes and you hear rumours of one in the development, then stick one aside for me. You'll be the first to know. Thanks, thanks. very much. Well, I guess Marcus will just have to keep that imaginary camera on his wish list for now. Is a dedicated digital panoramic camera something you'd like to see on the market? Let us know in the comments below. And if we get enough of you saying that you would, then we'll pass it on to Hasselblad with a wee nudge. Well, sadly, that brings us to the end of another show. Where does the time go? The good news, though, is that we'll be back in just a couple of weeks with another action-packed episode. We'll be back in this format. We will be venturing high up into the mountains to learn all about what to take when working at exposed altitudes. We'll be showing you how to save weight without sacrificing quality and we'll be discovering a new location for you to check out in the south of the UK. If you appreciate what we do here at Photography Online then please do give us a thumbs up. It helps promote our channel to more new people. And don't forget you can now become an official Photography Online supporter. Simply go to the link below or hit the join button if you can see that. As as well as receiving our annual magazine in PDF format, you'll also get to see the occasional bonus video, such as the behind the scenes one that our current supporters got to see from here. Okay, well, the producer is waving her arms. I've got to go. Until next time, take good care, but most of all, take good photos.